So when I was a kid, here's something I heard all the time. You talk too much. And now I think about that and you're here listening to this podcast. That's one of the things I love to do. I also have a blog where I share a lot of my thinking. I also speak for a living. And what's really interesting is that the classrooms that I thrived in knew that I talked too much and they tapped into it and they taught me how to harness it. You know, when to talk, when were the appropriate times, when was the time to use my voice? I think to this podcast, one of the things I've really tried to develop is the ability to listen. Cause I don't think we should be talking all the time if we don't have the ability to listen, because then what do our words really mean? But there is something that was a strength there that was often seen as a weakness was something that, you know, I needed to conform to a certain type of way. Whereas some people that in my educational career as a student saw as a strength and they tapped into it. And I think our perception really matters and the perception we have of our kids matters because they adopt that. And one of the things I really believe is that kids will always live up to expectations, whether they're high or low. So where do we set them? And how do you think of that? And really looking at our differences, the things that we do are those strengths that we can, you know, tap into. How do we develop these kids so they have that belief in themselves and develop that confidence uh, and learn to utilize those gifts, whether they fit within the context of school or not. That's one of the reasons I really appreciate this conversation with Dr. Vicki Waller. Uh, she wrote the book, Yes, Your Child Can, Creating Success for Children with Learning Differences. And I really c connected with this message. A little side note, which is really interesting. Uh, Vicki is actually the tutor to um, uh, Kourtney Kardashian's kids, which is really interesting, uh, but wasn't really the premise of bringing her on the podcast. It was just kind of an interesting aside. Um, to see that she works, you know, with, with different, you know, tutors, she has a very distinguished career and her focus on really kind of seeing the gifts that children's bring is something that I really connected with. It's something I want for my own kids. It's something I want for every single kid when they bring, you know, those talents and gifts to our school. Do we see that? But I think we also got a little bit into the conversation talking about, do we do this for adults? We have this system where we often are focusing, oh, we need to talk about kids' strengths, but then we constantly put in our, our data plans or whatever you want to call them, uh, what we're not good at and how we're going to fix it. And then we wonder why educators are demoralized, but then are encouraged to lift up strengths, right? I do believe it's the same thing. We, we, the things that we want for our kids, we should want for our teachers, for the people that are closest to our children as well. And that's something that we really focus on. How do we start with the gifts of the people? How do we see those gifts and bring that out? And it's one of the reasons I really love this conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I am blessed to have uh, Dr. Vicki Waller on the podcast today, who is a rock star tutor. And I, I agree with it, but... <laughs> I didn't just say it. It was Kourtney Kardashian because she actually tutors Kourtney Kardashian's kids, uh, which is very, very interesting. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about that, but you, know, you can talk about it if you want. But I don't want to get you know demonetized. Well, we don't <laughs> monetize anyway, but still, I don't want to get in trouble for this. But uh, it, I'm really excited to talk to you. You have a ton of different experience. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your new book out there too. But if you can just kind of just tell everyone who you are, what you do today, and and uh, how you got there, that'd be a great way to start. Okay. Well, I am a reading teacher. I'm an ed educational therapist. I started out many years ago. Um, I've been teaching for over 40 years. I taught in classrooms for um, about five or six years. And then I started, I got my, do my master's degree, my doctorate, and I became a reading teacher. So mm -hmm. I would be a special reading teacher in a school seeing kids who needed help. And I just, I, as I said once before, and I say it all the time, even in the 70s, you never heard Vicki Waller saying, oh, I have a kid who has learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. Never. It was learning differences because all of my kids, and I know this sounds weird because there's thousands of them. Mm -hmm. Every kid I've ever taught has abilities, not disabilities. You just have to find what it is. And if you find what it is, then they want to learn and they they feel good about themselves. It, you know, I have just this funny little story that I want to tell you. I got, it was Passover and it's when everybody sits around a table and they have to read. So of course, 
my students have nervous breakdowns because you go around the table and they have to mm-hmm. read and they can't read. And I was remembering nine years ago with my student and I got a letter at night after Passover and it said from the father, I'm crying. And I thought, oh, he probably couldn't, Alex couldn't read at the table. And so I wrote him, it's nine years later, the child is six feet two, gets all A's at school and he's brilliant, he's fantastic. And I'd called the father and I said, oh, do you remember that email? He said, yes. And I said, it's because he read at the table. Mm -hmm. And the father said, no, I'm going to cry. He said, what you gave him, Mm -hmm. the blessing and the gift was confidence. Mm -hmm. You gave him confidence. And then he could do the other things. And I started thinking when you mentioned the Kardashians, uh, Penelope wrote, I'm really smart, like Vicky says I am. I think because of COVID, kids like Courtney and her brother, who don't have learning issues, but because they had the computer and they were in first grade, this was one was in first grade, one was in kindergarten. And you're starting to learn to read. And all of a sudden you have two years on a computer. And it was difficult for a lot of children. Right. And you now you're in third grade and they say, okay, do a five page report. And these are kids going, what? Do a five? Mm-hmm. I mean, like they're really mentally still in first grade. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a very difficult time for kids. Yeah. And that, that approach, I, like I, when I, when you're talking about that and seeing some of the, the differences in our kids, I remember actually one student was a principal. He could. He was probably grade six or seven and he could read adults in such a way, but he would, he would do it for purely evil purposes. So if he, he (laughs) could figure out how to get under your skin and he could do it. And, and I actually could read it really well. Cause I also knew how to do that at a very young age. So I was like, I would think so. You're right. And so like, I could pick that up. Right. Like I know if I, if I want to get under your skin, I can do that. I know I'll find your weaknesses and go that. And he had teachers coming into my office crying all the time. And I'm like, look, I know this is really hard. This kid, there's something about this kid who has this ability to read people. It is not, it, he is using it for evil. We have to teach him how to actually use it in a positive way. Cause there is huge benefits to this, right? If you have that ability and you hear people talking about the importance of emotional intelligence, this kid had just was off the charts with emotional intelligence, but he just used it for the wrong you know, purposes. And so I really worked with him and he was actually like by the end of this and I, I like his academics was one thing. He actually did very well academically. And I think a lot of times uh, when we talk about kids struggling or they're having issues, they're, they're struggling with the things that we have decided to teach them, but they actually have strengths in other areas. And I think that's yes. something that we actually have to see is that, oh, we're complaining about this, but yeah, this kid, this thing that we don't teach, this kid excels at. And so they're coming to the space for eight hours be determined that oh like we're we're saying they're bad but then they go somewhere for two hours a day and then they're excelling but then they come back to this place so how do we actually make that you know longer part of the day so he he became one of the you know one of the most beloved kids in that school because i worked with him seeing like hey this this is seen as a detriment and so instead of trying to like suppress this ability that he's using for the wrong purposes it's actually how does he utilize this to help I would actually, you know, really kind of, you know, make the people around him better as opposed to like deflate them. And that was, there was a lot of work, but it was hard. It was hard to see it. I think maybe there was a benefit because I knew I could be that kid as well. And I was that kid for a part of my time. So I was like, okay, like people saw something in me that I, you know, that was good and brought that back. So that that's something. And so that's why I really connected with when I, when I saw the title of your book and we you know we had conversations. That's something I've always been focused on. I got to ask you this now. Um, this is, maybe it's a little self plug, but before, when we got on, you have my book and you got tabs in it. So I'm going to ask you this question. So you got innovate inside the box, which I wrote with Kate Novak. Can you, you got to show it for those people watching on YouTube. I so appreciate I keep it. it. Next to, I keep it next to my bed. Look. Right. So look at this. So I gotta, I gotta ask you. Okay. So what was your big takeaway from that book? I'm really curious about that. Cause I didn't ask you that, but I saw a bunch of tabs. Was there something that stuck out to you? Uh, what connected? Yeah, you were you? a great. You are a fantastic principal. I love that more than anything. And you understand children, you understand teachers, and you understand this whole thing about strengths because you were talking about it even Mm -hmm. here, strengths and passions of kids. And it is the most important thing. And the trouble is 
I hope the parents will see through my book, wait a minute, I have to find the good parts of my kids. Right. They're so nervous that their children, there's something wrong with them that they don't stop and go, oh, well, oh yeah, he could put right. together a, a 10,000 piece spaceship from Lego. What? Mm -hmm. I right. mean, they don't think about that. And I think that's what I love about, well, it's probably because everything you say I <laughs> like. So, I mean, you know, so I like go. the book. I don't know. I, you know, I take notes on it all the time and I pull out things. But I think that's it. It's believing in these kids and trying to use their strengths and passions to teach them. And I know parents find it difficult because they're so, do you know, something just happened. Understood.org said the new statistics 48% of parents still think their kid will snap out of it. And 33% right. of teachers think children with, with differences are lazy. Mm. I was so upset about those. And Ned Hallowell, when I told him about it, and he's a very famous uh, uh, author also mm -hmm. and a doctor with ADHD. And he just said to me, we have a lot of work to do. And we do, but I believe it's people like you writing books like this. Well, I appreciate and maybe that. my book too, that maybe will help the parents to say, wait a minute, let's get some help. Well, it's it's kind of like saying a kid, oh, a kid can't keep their attention, right? Like they and then you know, a quick diagnosis of ADHD. And I'm not talking doctoral stuff or anything like that, because I'm not that person. But then right. watching that kid play video games for eight hours, and it's like they can keep their attention. But maybe they and just anything they like, stuff. right? And so it's just kind of trying to figure that stuff out, right? So it is, and it is looking for that, and I think that that's one of the things that Katie and I, uh, Katie Novak and I, who obviously co-wrote the book with me, um, we really focused on is actually that yeah, we want to develop where kids are struggling, and we want to do the same thing. But I think that as you mentioned earlier, the the notion of confidence, right? If kids come to school and we're always like, we need to fix this, we need to fix this, we need to fix this. And then we're like, why do they hate being here? It's like, because you keep telling them they suck all day. And so of course they don't want to be there, right? And so I always say, it's not about ignoring weaknesses, it's about starting with strengths and actually seeing yep. that. And I think that's really powerful. And so kind of tying this in, and I like, I like this is why I really, like I said, I was really compelled with your book. And maybe it's just because we agree. I, mean, that's I, I know it. that's what I was but, thinking. Oh, I wish he was my principal. <laughs> uh, well, well, and so let's just, your, the title of your book is yes, your child can creating success for children with learning differences. So just give us a little quick synopsis uh, of the book. And I, I, there's probably a lot we can glean from the title. So what, what, what's in the book that the title doesn't tell us? Maybe that's, maybe that's a place. Okay. To start. Well, what's happening is, okay. I'm taking the parents on a journey. Okay. So for, I, it's the exact journey they're going to go through mm -hmm. from the importance of early intervention. Okay. Don't keep saying he'll grow out of it. He's not growing out of it. My favorite one is when a mother or father says, I was just like him. I, this dry, drove me crazy. I was just like him. And I have a company now for $20 million. And I said, well, maybe you were able to compensate during the time i said but your child isn't compensating and we have to find what he's good at but this father really didn't want to do the early intervention he finally did it finally and the child is doing very well but maybe the father could compensate and look at elon musk was on a spaceship and he has disabilities he's talked about it differences he calls it dyslexia and he's they said oh did you make how was it up there and he said well for 10 minutes it was great he said but they said undo the uh tag here undo it and you're you'll be able to um have get out of your seat but because he doesn't know his right from left still he undid his seat belt <laughs> which oh. meant he was in real trouble but i mean to me, it was sort of funny, but it's not funny, but it was funny because those things aren't going to go away, but obviously he's compensated. So early intervention is number one. They're not growing out of it. A guide through the testing process. Who are these people? Who do I go to? It's very important. And your principal, somebody or a doctor can help you with who to go to, to have your child evaluated, to see their strengths and what they need. Then everybody's afraid of medication. Uh, you know, there's so many medications out now. It's just not Ritalin or, oh, he's going to become a mm -hmm. drug addict. Uh, Carol Dweck, I think that's her name yep. from Stanford, 
uh, said that they worked out that children who don't get help become drug addicts later. It's not that they become drug addicts because they've gotten help with taking medicine. So that's very important. Also, understanding what it is and getting rid of the fear of medication, choosing the perfect person to work for your child. And you know what? I'm a snob. I'm going, well, I have a doctorate. I don't care. I have seen the best tutors being just the second grade teacher who knew what it was all about and worked with the kid for years after mm -hmm. school. Find that person who your child relates to. Um, just how all these people are in your child's life. Then I go through a whole thing on reading, writing, executive functioning, so that it tells them what can you do at home? You know, from make using Amazon boxes, get them off the computer, use an Amazon box and make something. Write a story about you like your dog. You'll love this, George. Mm -hmm. My student did a bark mitzvah <laughs> for, his, for his dog. He, he, and that. because he's a chef, Eight years old, he was a chef, and he's still a chef. He was a chef, and he made all the food, and he made everything, and we had a bark mitzvah for his dog. And then a few years later, he got a hamster, and he had a hamster mitzvah for the dog. It was hilarious. <laughs> Is this the best school for your child? Um, of course, the passions and strengths. And I think the problem is the parents are so worried about what's wrong with the child that they right. forgot to look at what's right. And I just open their eyes. When I ask a parent, you know, what are some good things your child does? Sometimes they can't tell me. This little boy came to me and he wouldn't write. He wouldn't read. Oh boy, he was oppositional defiant. I had said to his mother, what can I have here for him that he'll like to do? And she just didn't say it. And he's the one who loved whales. And I connected him with the man who was caught in the whale's mouth a year ago mm -hmm. and he was the lobster fisherman i had seen it in the newspaper this kid loved whales and he said to me i said well, how did he get not get eaten and the little boy says well vicky it's a whale he has baleen he doesn't have seven years old he doesn't have teeth we interviewed him and this child who wouldn't read wouldn't write he said i'm dictating it to you i said fine dictate it he dictated 25 questions he sat in front of the computer like an NBC interviewer. He read, he read, he can't read. He read because he wrote them. He could read the questions. He asked the questions and he waited for mm -hmm. the answers. And at the end, it was over. It was fabulous. He made him, I just have to show you. The oh, mother you said, go. nah, he doesn't have, okay, but it's, it's a there. whale, but look at the feet. The feet are sticking out. His feet are sticking out. <laughs> He is so creative and it just sort of, it got to him. And now, and I swear I didn't teach him to read and he's reading. I mean, he's reading and writing is still hard, but it's okay. It's okay. But it was just something that he loved. Um, and then I go into things like avoiding meltdowns during school breaks, things like that, that p kids with issues have. Mm -hmm. You think you're going on a vacation, won't this be great? No, everybody's getting ready and freaking so I give them, what do you do seven days before? Pick out your favorite toy. Right. Give me the five shirts you want to take. And, and this is my opinion, my parents sometimes think you go on a vacation, you take your child off a of medication. The problem is, without medication, the child is all over the place. He can't control right. himself. He's so, you have to check with your own doctor. Maybe you can lessen the medicine. I'm not a doctor. Mm -hmm. But it was really interesting. They said, boy, did we learn a lesson. He just was oppositional defiant. They couldn't get anything out of him. They learned a lesson. He needed his meds all the time. It doesn't go away. Um, and then I just have all, I have a list of books, how to read to your child, what kinds of books they might like. It's filled with writing things to do with your child. And I'm on um, uh, grandparentslink.com, which is fantastic. It's for grandparents, but parents can go on to it. And UCLA mm -hmm. Semmel Institute. And a lot of the ideas are there that I do with kids. I do a lot of stuff with Amazon boxes and old cameras. You take an old <laughs> camera and you can put stuff on and make characters. And then yeah. they've made something. And I go, can you write a story about it? Sure. Because they made it. They'll know a story and they make up unbelievable stories. Well, hey, I got to ask you. 
I got to ask you this. So we, you, 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 you talked about this notion of like parents will think that their kids will uh, just grow out of stuff. Right. And maybe, and, and, and I'm want to kind of distinguish this because I think is that sometimes the idea that they'll grow out of maybe the perception of a bad behavior. So like, I'll give you an example of this. So I used to get in trouble for talking all the time. Right. And the hope was I would grow out of this. Well, I haven't. Yeah. I, 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 I do. I, have <laughs> I a do podcast. podcasts. I, I speak for a living. I write. I talk more than I probably ever did. Now, the one thing that I have had to really work on is the notion of listening. It's one of the reasons I love doing the podcast, right? Really kind of, you know, I told you before, we don't have any questions for this part uh, because it is, it actually makes me focus on listening and, you know, hearing things. So sometimes is it about, um, you know, like obviously if a, a child can't is struggling with reading to say, well, they'll just grow out of it. That's probably not the best approach. There's, there's things that we do in that process, but sometimes it's like the, the perception of a behavior that is bad. Is it something that we can actually harness or develop? So like kind of disti distinguish between those two, if you could. Well, you absolutely can, but I mean, it, I see a lot of kids. I'll tell you the kids, the kids that are hyper or oppositional defiant, that's showing. And usually the parents are going to be getting help with somebody because it's, it's out there and it's, you know, the teacher's complaining about the kids. The kids that I think are harder to um, diagnose are the inattentive because mm -hmm. they're sitting there nicely, like the little boy who sat here looking at a cow uh, for three years and there was an alligator on my tree. What? An alligator in my tree? Well, he was inattentive. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the kids that the parents say, oh, they're just not paying attention or, oh, that's okay. They're not hyper because they hear the words right. ADHD. And I say, most of the kids that I see, because I see them after they're having trouble in school, are kids that are usually inattentive. Because right. the kids that are hyper getting into trouble, usually that's caught earlier. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about what you say, there's, there's a perception that we actually have. And uh, I've challenged this several times, is that this, this thing I've seen, educators, I've done it. I'm not going to pretend I'm innocent of this. Saying like, like the snapping fingers, like eyes up here. And the perception that if I'm looking okay. at you, that if I'm looking at you, that means I'm listening. No, all it means is I'm looking at you. That's it. Right. <laughs> and for me, I actually listen better when I'm fidgeting. And I actually, because I struggle with hearing in one of my ears, I actually turn my ear to better hear people. So I actually kind of look away. And the other thing too, is that some cultural differences, the, the eye contact is actually seen as detrimental in different cultures, right? Like that's actually not a beneficial. And it's kind of like, no, you have to pay attention to me. So it is often, sometimes it's our perception of what the, that we feel comfortable with that, whether the child is learning or not, as opposed to understanding the child. Is that, is that off what I just said? Or is that, do you see that difference there? No, I see that. I think, I think the quiet kids though in class, mm -hmm. they're not bothering, teachers don't mind them. Right. Because they're not because and they're only they're only when I went into this classroom, my student, she had five tables and the one little table had five kids who really were not writing in this book. And I this right. kid was so smart. I knew he could write a book. He could write about soccer like you can't believe. And she was dealing with a kid who was hyper and bothering her and running outside and the other four tables could do it. And all I could think of was if she would have just sat down at that table with those five kids who were inattentive, mm -hmm. she could have helped them. Like she could have said to him, what would you like to write about? Or if she knew him, right. she would have said, oh, you like soccer so much. Let's write a story about soccer. Mm -hmm. And she was, I mean, I couldn't say anything to her. She was a teacher who's been doing it for a long time. But it may, you know, I, I did write a little note about him saying he really loves this. Try to, you know, that's, I didn't say she was doing anything incorrectly. But I think that it tends to be the teachers tend to react to the kids that are hyper and they don't want them in yeah. their class. Yeah. And, and the, the interesting thing, I'm, I'm thinking about this as a principal and some of the things that I wish I could go back and, you know, be better at. A lot of times um, we, we pay attention to maybe some of the louder staff members or the louder parents who, you know, or maybe, I don't know if like 
oppositional defiant might be a good way to I don't know if that's the best way to describe Well, it depends. It. Is the parent being oppositional and something they don't like what you're doing? Yeah, like, it, it, I, yeah, and I don't know this, but I, I think I think the point that I'm trying to get back to is this idea that sometimes the staff that were just quiet were sometimes the people that I ignored, but they were really great staff and they also craved mentorship. They also wanted to get better. And sometimes you ignore those people and then they actually then leave to go somewhere else or they start actually regressing back because they feel they're not necessarily, I'm not saying they're not necessarily getting attention, but like I, I know a lot of people that have left organizations because they craved mentorship, they craved guidance, but they weren't getting it. And then they felt like all the attention is being paid to the people who might not want to be here, who are causing grief and and I understand why that attention has to be paid but sometimes we we the people that were you know want are actually craving uh growth but we don't pay attention to those are the ones we kind of hurt yeah it's interesting that's an interesting point I mean I'm trying to think of when I was in a school well, I was always so loud you know I was <laughs> except one I, principal he he would go by my door and just close the door and I used to open it he would walk by and I would open the door <laughs> Because I had the kids all over the right. floor doing all kinds of things. I don't know. I think right now I'm really afraid because teachers are leaving. And I'm yeah. worried that we're going to be losing our good teachers. They just, it was more than any of us really, you know, it was just very difficult for the kids. Don't forget yeah. the parents. Of course, for me, the stories were fantastic because one student, it was in the, I wrote it and it was in the New York Times and I had to laugh. That's what I got in the, in the, in the New York Times with, but he made himself a, an alien, seven years old. He made himself mm -hmm. an alien. So I was teaching an alien on online and I would send him books and he would read to me. So I didn't care that he was an alien. One of the other teachers said, I can't stand it. Why is he an alien? I said, well, he made himself an alien. I thought it was sort of creative. I don't yeah. know. But it's been a, a tough time. And I think the teachers are being asked so much that I think a lot of a lot of good teachers, I bet, are going to be leaving. Yeah, I, I just have that feeling. And I, I maybe I'm, I'm uh, maybe this is kind of, uh, you know, simplifying things. I, I think it for me, I think a lot of teachers leading because of leadership and I, it, it depends on the level. Sometimes it's at the state or provincial level. Sometimes it's at the district level, sometimes at the school level, because it, it is that thought of, uh, Hey, sometimes we need to push people, but sometimes you need, you need to back off because they're just getting through the day right now. And so like, it's kind of seeing that too. So I, I, you know, I, I, there's probably a whole blog post, a whole series of things we can talk oh. about with that too. But yeah, like I understand that. So here's the last question I have for you. Um, what is the one big takeaway that people can expect from your book? If they read the book yeah, and they follow the step-by-step, -step, just like in what to expect, what you're expecting, if you follow it, yeah, you will find success with your child. I have, if you really follow it, and you do what you're supposed to do and get the help and get the testing and try to, I know it's hard. It's hard being with a child who has a lot of attention problems and hard at home with just all the, you know, not having your notebook, not having this. I give a lot of suggestions mm. of how to handle that how to pack up the, you know, the backpack the night before, how to yeah. just little things like that at the end of every chapter, just turn to the end of the chapter and see, oh, what do I do now? She's, it's typical. They go on a vacation right. and the, the teacher says, write something every night and bring it back the first day of school. And my students always say to me, how do you know that Dr. Waller? How do you know my teacher's going to ask that? I said, because I know your teacher's going to say, what did you do over summer vacation? Let's right. have something ready. So you know it. Ask your kid ahead of time. What five things did we do that you really loved? Maybe mm -hmm. write it down for them. So they go in and they start the year not being scared. It's typical things. My book gives you everyday kinds of things, maybe tricks to help you with, not tricks, but just ideas takeaways that's really yeah. what i have a takeaway at the end of every chapter to help you with this child 
And, and so and to I, find success and to find success for going to sake. Right. And I think that, you know, you know, success in a way that's meaningful to the kid, not success as painted as one thing for no, no, no success child, right? for the child by yeah. finding their strengths and their passions and building on that, you know, well, whether it's, it could be a good soccer player, could be right. a basketball player. Maybe the kid likes animals, go take them to animals. I mean, <laughs> find what they like. Do you know, when I ask a parent, before I meet them, well, what are your child's passions? Do you know 99% of them can't tell me? Right. Because they're so busy worrying about what's wrong with my child, they're forgetting right. to look at what's right. And I think that's what you get out of my book. If, a teacher, if you follow that step-by-step, step, you'll find what's right and your child will feel success and find success. Yeah. And I think sometimes the shift in our own perception is what best helps kids. Right. And that, you know, cause they, they start seeing the things that we see in them too. Right. So right. Yeah, they'll, they'll always live up to your expectations, whether they're high or low. So, uh, Vicki, it's been awesome to talk to you. I'm oh, so really I know. You've been very passionate. So come visit, come visit. <laughs> okay, well, next time I'm for LA for a Lakers game, I'm in. Right. So, okay. So that, but Hey, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Check out the book. Yes. Your child can creating success for children with learning differences. Vicki, thanks again for being on the podcast. George, I love it. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And thanks everyone for listening. Have a wonderful day.